Aloha and welcome back, everyone. I am your host, Gabe, from the Search for Tiki. And tonight we have a very special guest. Uh, Thor is a former uh, Disney Imagineer. He also had a gallery of his art on Waikiki. He's sculpted numerous mugs, more mugs than I can even be aware of or count. And I have a website that's dedicated to that. Uh, so I'm super excited to talk to Thor. Um, I also want to just give a shout out to our sponsor here, uh, Plantation Rum who is sponsoring 13 Nights of Tiki Frights, uh, both the cocktails and the mug giveaways. And with that said, I'm really excited to talk to Thor, so I think we should bring him in. Hey. How's it going, buddy? Good. It's uh, good to see I you. I look over at you from the other box. The other box? Well, uh, on my thing, you're right over there, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it And uh, it... It felt like the Brady Bunch uh, in miniature. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, anyway. dude, I also love this aquarium behind you. Oh yeah, um, I, uh, I'm. It's, maybe it's my uh, my uh, obsession since I was a kid with the bahuka. Um, I, I I love uh, fish of um, aquariums. I've always had them. And so I've been, I surround myself with them as much as possible um, <laughs> when I work. Uh, fi and it's really funny because there's a bunch of uh, fish in here that will, my uh, main working area is right over here. And they'll watch me during the day. They'll come, they'll, they'll come by and like get real <laughs> close and look and they'll watch me when I'm drawing or when I'm doing something. And uh, I don't know what they're thinking, but uh yeah, they're um, they're kind of cool happy, to have happy, either happy thoughts or they're really angry and they're they're secretly plotting <laughs> yeah, their demise. Yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> hard to hard to read a fish. One um, of these but, days, uh, you're just going to be drawing. Next thing you know, whack whack whack, you fall out of your chair. <laughs> yeah. You, so, like, you've been you're kind of like obsessed with water. Were you born with legs or were you born with fins? Um, you know that's funny. You should say that. Um, I've always been, uh, since I was maybe four or five years old, um, I've always been obsessed with, um, being in the water, under the water, on the water. Um, I used to, uh, do a lot of, I've done a lot of scuba diving and diving over the years, actually been diving with, um, a lot of the Navy divers, uh, in Hawaii that, that were kind enough to take me to their facilities. I even went down on the bottom of a tank in a, a World War II um, Mark V diving um, suit and helmet and got to feel what that was like. And uh, boy, I really have a lot of respect for those guys that had to do salvage diving in World War II with you know, uh, an eight inch window you know, to look out of um, while, while you have a uh, hundred pounds of weight on you and you're uh, on the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's, it's, it's an experience. I got to pull up this. Uh, so I saw this, I, I believe it's made with rum. You, I think you paint with rum, but based on what you were just I describing, this, <laughs> this, that's one oh, of those yeah. diving suits that you're talking about. And that's a good uh, idea. yeah, uh-huh. Sure. That was just kind of a fun, um, you'll, you'll come across some of the images I've, I've sent, uh, have to do with they're there. I call them rum paintings, but really, I mean, some people call, called them rum paintings, but really they're just the same thing as an artist would do what I would call a pen and ink drawing. Um, ex except instead of using ink, um, I figured out a way to, uh, light rum on fire essentially. And, uh, um, uh, with uh, a concoction of 151 rum and things like that that would burn. And it, it, it will condense and, and uh, you can control how dark the rum becomes. You know, you, could, you, can, um, you can condense it down to almost a syrup that's like a really, really dark uh, medium to, 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 to um, paint with. And, and and that was only because I was challenged by a bartender in Waikiki. <laughs> <laughs> Cocktails were involved. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he, he uh, um, I, I, you're familiar with Wyland, who does the uh, whales and all that kind of stuff. And this bartender right across from my gallery uh, at, at Duke's um, said, why don't you do that? Why don't you do these? And Wyland is making all this money right now on doing just ink paintings. You know, he'll just he'll just like sketch out a dolphin or something like that. And they're selling for hundreds of dollars. And, and um, why don't why don't you do that in your gallery? And I go, well, cause it's kind of already, he's already doing it. I mean, why, why should I do that? And they knew me well enough that they said, well, I'll tell you what would be good for a Thor painting. A Thor version of it would be if you painted rum, because you know, you come here every night at 11 o'clock after the gallery closes and uh, have a couple of libations. And so they said, why don't you paint? <laughs> Could you paint in rum? And I, uh, um, I, I don't know. So I just went out on my lanai one night and uh, started playing around and painted in rum. And, and those things just like sold like crazy in the gallery. Um, it's weird, silly. And as a matter of fact, I got tired of doing it. And I was, I, I was actually uh, almost sickened by the fact that I had to keep painting <laughs> in rum. Dude, this but is this is one of those things that I like talking to artists. I've heard a lot. Um, I think yeah. Henrik, he all and managed to manages to always come up in these conversations. But I believe he was one of them. Where or or uh, a lot of artists that create art specifically to sell in Hawaii, um, they get kind of tired of doing the same stuff because there's a certain aesthetic that the tourists yeah. going to Hawaii are looking for and yeah. that, that's what they want to buy and at, at a certain point you get yeah. tired of doing maybe the same turtles over and over and over again did you kind of encounter that with your um that was my get my experience with my gallery chapter in my life was exactly that I mean I had come from being a uh show designer concept designer and art and art director you know in the entertainment industry and when I started doing gallery things um I would paint stories. Um, uh, there's a lot of story behind all my paintings and uh, I wanted everyone to have a lot to look at and explore and discover. And I found that um, at least in Hawaii, there, um, the galleries, the, the bigger galleries, they had my work at the time. Um, they, uh, they, they weren't as interested in that as much as what just sold to the common uh, person who had the money to go into an expensive gallery in Waikiki and put down ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on a painting. Um, it, they, they often didn't even really care about the story behind it. Some did. So, sometimes I, ha I was there and I had to tell the story and, that's what sold the painting, but other times, that's the know, best. That's it, what I like best about your paintings. You take away the narrative, and uh, that, I feel like that's like the heart and soul of your yeah, like everything you do, your mugs, your art. It's all about narrative. It's all about storytelling, and that's that's my um, career in uh, with Disney and with Universal and everything is that you start with a story and then the artwork for me is the easy part it's just that it's it's telling the story um in a way that people can get into your brain and see what the story is in your mind by looking at a common image you know and so when when um when people would buy my artwork in hawaii and uh um uh, they'd say well what so what is it that spoke to you about this you know uh, I, i'd hear the salespeople talk about this to the, the to the buyer of the work and and they would say things like oh my wife just loved the wave that you painted in there or that the colors are perfect for our uh condo in uh uh Kauai. and i and and <laughs> as an artist i was like geez oh, you know God. really <laughs> and, and some of the and some of the gallery managers were like, paint more of those waves and we'll sell them like crazy. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, the wave is just a prop in a, in a, uh, like a prop in a movie in the storytelling of the artwork. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to do that. And I think that's what eventually led to me getting a little more disillusioned with 
the gallery scene is that it wasn't motivating me the same way um, anymore. And I was starting to do art for different reasons than my own inspirations or my own personal experiences. Yeah. I have a, uh, someone saying, cause there's a, a new drinking game every time the, the smoke detector chirps. I like that. <laughs> Can you hear the smoke detector? Yeah, every couple couple seconds of smoke. Yeah, and but and I have the, a picture the, of the 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 also the uh, the fact is I have a parrot that imitates it, so you won't know <laughs> um, you won't know sometimes when it's actually the smoke detector or when it's my parrot just it's uh, when you're parrot. making that noise. So. And That's as, as you makes, drink makes at every chirp, that gets more and more difficult to decipher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got a picture here of your uh, your store. Yeah. Meat That's, um, that was the first, you know, I don't know how many, there's been a lot of new people that come into the tiki scene in the last decade. And uh, that picture was in about 2006. I'd say, and um, uh, that's right across, that's on Kalakaua Avenue. It was right across the street from um, Dukes um, and uh, right in the heart of uh, Waikiki. And um, we did really well. Um, I sold, I, 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 a lot of people have, still write me today that, that say that, you know, their experience in that store was, um, the gateway for them for Tiki because they bought uh, in there. I sold not only my own artwork, but I sold um, the book of Tiki uh, mugs from Tiki Ooh. farm, uh, all kinds of different things. And believe it or not, you think in Hawaii that Tiki would be spilling out everywhere, but that was, um, it's not the case. And it was start. It's, it was the beginning the back. back at, yeah. And now it looks like Rodeo Drive on that same area that um, uh, was once filled with, you know, the the uh, international marketplace and other th and other uh, really wonderful um, uh, Polynesian uh, little um, gems. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so that that was a really interesting time for me. We were right. I was right below the. Um, Don Ho show upstairs. As a matter of fact, there was a hole <laughs> about four inches, three inches wide in the ceiling. I can't no. tell you why. <laughs> uh, in our, in our, um, in the, in the, in my gallery. And uh, it's probably something, a plumber or an air conditioner repairman left or something like that. But you could hear the Don Ho show going on through that. So I used to call it the Don Hole. <laughs> and people who would like a, uh, people not go to the show could come in the gallery. <laughs> yeah. And they could listen to the Don Ho show through the Don Hole. And uh, anyway, so it was um, fun. It was really fun times, I have to admit. I, too fun, as a matter of fact, because uh, it was way too much, um, you know, um, Bar, I knew I knew way too many bartenders and and, and everything at that time and and uh, you know uh, spent way too much time late at night sitting and drinking uh, with uh, people. <laughs> Those are the best so, times, though. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. You, like you were saying, you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to be a veteran of tiki. You could be in tiki a week on Facebook, and someone will inevitably mm -hmm. ask. At least once every week, I'm headed to Hawaii. What are the best tiki bars? And the answer I've is California. That. Like, there aren't mm -hmm. great tiki bars in Hawaii. There are a couple now on Oahu um, no. drinking spots, but generally speaking, it's California. It's not. It's yeah, not Hawaii. It's it, surprisingly uh, there. It wasn't. I mean, you'd think it would be the mecca, right, of tiki and. Uh, all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't. There was an old restaurant called uh, The Willows um, when I was a little kid, because I've been going there a long time. I think uh, I, I might have touched on a few times that, in fact, that my 
my uh, my uncle Jack lived on the Big Island, and so every summer I'd end up spending the entire summer in Hawaii since I was a little kid uh, diving. Um, he, he used to um, get tropical fish that would be a saltwater fish that would be exported to the mainland to the pet uh, fish industry. So we'd spend the morning diving. I'd be underwater for a couple hours and he'd say, if you get your quota and we'd, we use these slurp guns, they were these giant hypodermic, look like a giant shot, you know, that would pull in uh, a fish so that it was, wasn't harmed or injured. And, uh, damsels and different things like that and then once we were done we got to play you know so we'd make we'd build forts on the beach and we'd um we'd free dive i did a lot of free diving matter of fact i have an ear uh issue uh because we would uh try to see how deep we could free dive by taking the the boat out <laughs> uncle jack's boat out um and this sounds like another drinking story yeah, well, it's a true one. We grab the anchor with our arms um, on the side of the boat, and then someone would trip the anchor line, and and we would be sent down, sometimes eighty feet or more, and um, sit down there for a while, and then come on up, <laughs> and um, you'd have to equalize as you go down, and uh, which yeah. means you know you gotta hold your nose, and I don't know how much you know about diving like that, but uh, uh, it it did. A few times I just wasn't able to do it fast enough, and it it's <laughs> kind of injured my ear. <laughs> but, but was uh, it worth it? Was it worth it? it yes, it was worth it. Uh, we had the best time. Yeah, we, we are had, you we had so time. like for a lot of people, water is kind of terrifying. Um, the beach is one thing. You know, unless it's Cape Cod with the, the great whites mm -hmm. where I am. <laughs> but as soon right. as you get into like endless ocean, a lot of people find that absolutely terrifying. Are you uh -huh. kind of like intimidated by the ocean or all bets no, off? Um, you know, the funny thing is that I now that I know what's under the water all. I mean, I've been diving it in Japan. I've been diving all over Hawaii. I've been di I dived up and down our coast here in California. And um so I know pretty much what's down there. It's really more, um, I, I, I love to be down there and see what I'm, what's around me, even in bad, visi poor vi visibility, sometimes I would dive. So you could only see maybe eight, 10 feet away from me. You didn't know what, what the hell was gonna come at you. But if I, <laughs> I don't like the that. time to go, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I spent the time to suit up and go dive in, I was going to go down. I was going to go down to the bottom uh, of, of, of that uh, particular area. Um, I think that uh, most cases I've, you know, the funny thing is the, 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 uh, probably the, if you want to say scary or the most intimidating situation I ever came across was not with sharks or with anything that most people would think would, but I got, charged by a bull sea lion one time um diving <laughs> uh, uh and uh, it was it was a foggy day and this sea lion just was pissed off and it it just kept going charging underneath me and blowing bubbles and i don't know big really really big bull uh and uh and and it was in a heavy kelp forest um and uh, near Point Doom. And uh, that was a little intimidating because, you know, they can knock the regulator out of your mouth. And then if you're in kelp and all that kind of stuff, you know, you don't want to be tangled up in that stuff. But, but uh, otherwise, I've had nothing but great experiences. Are you supposed to like run, like try to get away or just like face it? I don't know. I, I'd never been trained to, to deal with a full sea line, line. protocol. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, I didn't know what it was initially because all I could see was uh, a shadow at first and it had a big pointed nose and it was big. And I thought it was a white uh, or a, another shark. I, th I thought it was a shark actually. Um, and it wasn't until it got close enough to me that I could identify it as a, uh, as a, as a sea lion. 
Um, but I just, you know, oh, and my friend at the time, it was my buddy, died and panicked and ended up going to the surface. And so he's up there wallowing in the kelp uh, that's all laid on the surface and he's getting all tangled up in the kelp. So that was really more my concern is, is my buddy at that time that, that we could get back on shore, you know, than, uh, than the bull sea land. I figured he was going to do what he was going to do. I don't know, but you know, I had a thick wetsuit on, so I figured if I get bit or something like that, it wasn't going to be too bad. Moral of the story is avoid the sea lions. <laughs> well, just respect them. You know, they're they're not the puppies of the sea that you you, uh, at least in that case, that you want them to be. You know, I wanted to treat it like a dog. You know, you you want to when you see them, and other times they've been very kind. You know, very curious and everything like that. And they look like just dogs that are with, with their ears tucked back, you know, <laughs> but this one, not so much. this one, I was, I was in his turf, I guess. I'm not it's really the same sure. thing as, as people, you know, like, every, like <laughs> they all have different yeah. personalities. They do. So, exactly. And they have bad days, but dude, we're, Absolutely. we're like, tw we're like 22 minutes into this. And I have all this stuff I want to talk to you about. And we're just... I can't believe how fast time is... Yeah, go. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, we're getting lost in stories. That's a good thing, though. But I want to... If I can, I want to show some of the pictures that you did, I believe, sure. during your time in, in Waikiki. Uh, you can correct me on that. Some of these may be more recent than that. Uh, so we got this one here. Yeah, it's more recent. That was... A little bit more recent yeah uh that was just a painting and and i won't get into the whole long story to, uh but um of how coconut monkeys made were were made because it was a story a lady in the international marketplace who was trying to sell coconut monkeys was telling me when i when i kind of interrogated her about well who, who really makes these do they really make them in hawaii and she came up with some, some story. She was um, this really cute um, um, lady um, and uh, looked like, you know, maybe an Islander or, or Filipino um, lady. And she said, oh, the geckos make them. They make them out in the, in the, in the shrubbery and in the taro uh, areas and all this kind of stuff. And so it just inspired me to... Um, do this painting that the geckos could figure out a way to carve coconut monkeys. Are geckos just like everywhere there? I know Tiki Rob's always he's making mugs yeah. and geckos and yeah, they are there. Matter of fact, there was one when I lived there um, that used to like ice cream, and every night it would come through the louvers. A lot of times, you know, in Hawaii, a lot of the places just have louvered windows because you got the breeze coming through all the time. And it would come in there and it would get on the kitchen, uh, come inside and get on the kitchen. It was because there was no screen on there. And it would uh, it would wait for its ice cream. And I would just put like a, you know, a half a <laughs> teaspoon of ice cream on the uh, <laughs> on this on the tile. And it would lick lick the ice cream and then take off, you know. So uh, they're pretty cute. Are you uh a controversial question. Are you more of a Dole Whip person or a shave ice person? I'm not really a sweets person at all, to be honest with you. Um, so, a matter of fact, most of the drinks I drink, if I go to a bar or something like that, I said, can you know, I often will say, can you tame down the um, simple syrup or whatever you're making? Um, because I, I really don't like sweet steps. But but between the two, it would be uh, shave ice. I've actually got a shave ice maker and I'll put, I'll make shave ice, but then I'll put like, you know, some concoction that I'll come up with on the top of it. Like I'll make a, a fruit puree, you know, in, in the uh, Vitamix blender and then pour it on the top of it, and that kind of thing. So you didn't mind sharing your ice cream with the gecko then? You're going like, eh. Not at all. You can have it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take it, man. You know, it's all yours. I, I have this other picture 
this happened. So last year we interviewed Tiki Tony, and for some reason, every question ended up being about monkeys. And in this case, it looks like it's just going to be an episode about seals and sea lions. <laughs> but I have this one here. Yeah, that my... was a, a cover. Uh, that was a, a painting I did that was commissioned by... Um, I'm trying to remember which magazine. I think it was either Got Rum or another magazine. I mean, this was like 10 years or more ago. Um, oh, no, it was Pirate Magazine. There was actually a magazine. There's a Pirate, Pirate Magazine? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, they came to me, and um, this was the cover image. And um, I had my daughter and her boyfriend posed for me. And I had this idea, you know, that that uh, that the, the, the pirate was about to take off, uh, go, go, to, go out to sea. And um, so he's asking for a kiss from the mermaid before he did that. And she, you know, the seal is with them like a pet. And uh, he, she says, close your eyes. And then as she closes, he puts his hands over his eyes. He thinks she's kissing him, but the seal is reaching up and giving this <laughs> the kiss to the pirate. And so I think I'd rather deal with this this seal than your sea lion, though. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As long as he doesn't bite my lip, yeah, that would be fine. You do a lot of mermaids, which we'll see some more of them here in these upcoming ones. Uh, but you know, some people draw mermaids kind of scary. Like we had a, a a mug that we gave away earlier on Thirteen Nights at Tiki Frights, which was the Fiji mermaid, and uh, by Chris Shima yeah. Ceramics. That thing's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, your mermaids are kind of more more appealing. Do you do you see them as uh, still the like the deadly sirens of the sea? Well, as you know, I do Fiji mermaids also, but um, uh. I'm very good friends with, um, we've been close friends for a long time with Marina, the fire eating okay. mermaid, Medu. as her official name is. And um, matter of fact, I had to take a trip to Florida last week and I got to go to the Weechi Wachi mermaid uh, theater show for the first time ever in my life. And I loved it. Yeah, I've always been fascinated with mermaids. Um, um, I think they're, I, I actually believe that there are mermaids of some form out there. I don't think they okay. look exactly like a half woman in, in that conveniently just changes into a fish tail, but uh, I believe there's something out there that uh, has inspired sailors for many centuries. Okay. Here's another one. Um, is this one? This one kind of looks like. Uh, that's Marina. Marina. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That looks like Marina. That's Marina. Um, yeah. Uh, my my tide is the name of that. Uh, M a i t i d e. Um, it was just an idea I had of a of a, of a mermaid drinking from a. Um, glass fish float that she has a cocktail in underwater under a dock in uh, right off the coast of Hawaii. And uh, I just painted it up. And, and uh, so Marina has always been kind enough to I'll say, Hey, you know, in the past I'll say, would you do me a favor? And just, I, I do a rough sketch and then, and I'd say, would you just kind of like, do this pose for me and so i can paint it uh, and uh she would and um we've had that kind of great friendship all this time i know she does like the uh, like photography underwater have you ever used yeah. any of those shots that she does I, I think it's like a class that she does like tiki oasis or something where you can actually like probably go into a pool and swim below and then they take photos of people no i haven't no I haven't used any of those photographs, but I know she has a a talent for photography as well as a lot of other things. I love this idea, pulling it up again. Um, and I don't know if this was intentional or not, but she's obviously drinking out of like a fish float. 
And then you got these yes. other fish floats just kind of like floating up here. And I kind of, yep. uh, when I looked, was looking at this, I was imagining that maybe you would just be swimming through the ocean and you'd find a, a fish float and uh, it would be full of Mai Tai and it'd be like, ooh, a little treat while yeah. we're down underwater. <laughs> yeah, let's have a little Mai Tai. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my imagination is, uh, it goes on and on and on. Matter of fact, it, uh, something I have to tame most of the time. My, you, you never <laughs> would want to be in my dreams at night. They go on and on and on and on and on. And sometimes I wake up exhausted. Um, and I don't know if that's a curse or a blessing, but, uh, were you a, were yeah. you a troubled child growing up? Like the teacher would be like, um, Focus. <laughs> I was, a, I was a, yes, I was a clown. Um, in class, if you were to see my report cards, it, um, my mom actually showed me the other day. It was always uh, Tom is a very bright child, but he's more interested in entertaining his classmates than he is focusing on his studies. And uh, so I would, uh, I would, you know. They were always trying to, um, you know, break me of that, <laughs> of that, that, of that tendency. Um, so, uh, matter of fact, I, I, you know, that I remember one time having to take one of those tests. You know, where you have to fill in with a with a number two pencil, all those little dot, little those circles, little, yeah, little circles. Um, and yep. it was like an ap aptitude test or something in in fourth grade, and. Um, I remember my mom being called in because she said, you know, your son is, he scored like lowest in the entire class. You know, what, 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 uh, what's going on? Is there anything happening at home? And my mom asked me and I admitted that what I did was I didn't even really read through the questions. All I did was fill in the circles to make an interesting pattern on that oh. <laughs> uh, test thing. You know, I'm like, I'm going to do three here, four here, make it look kind of like a flower that turns into a summer, you know. And so I came off probably as being incredibly uh, stupid, but uh, it was because I didn't take school seriously at that time. I still have nightmares to this day. Like I'm 30 <laughs> and like when people will say I, I have bad dreams about dying or I have bad dreams about being buried alive or whatever. And my bad dreams are like, I'm not going to graduate high school. <laughs> and I got yeah. my high school diploma like 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. I've had I dreams. I still have school nightmares. I think we all do. You know, didn't study for the test or whatever. You know, school is a traumatic experience. Uh, um, but uh, yeah. yeah. Speaking but otherwise, though, was, of... Uh, Speaking of uh, imagination, here's another picture uh, that I want to talk to you about. I believe it's called Pele's Promise. Mm hmm. Um, which yeah. uh, I think the idea was that this 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 person uh, makes an agreement with Pele. Yep. So, and then yeah. uh, she kind of allows, uh, is it a him? I don't know, uh, to live on this little hut at the volcano and provide safety. Yes. She, uh, he can live and surf and sit on that little chair out there and sip his Mai Tais and uh, um, do anything he wants to do as long as he is faithful to her. She will put him in an impossible scenario in his little ultimate shack up there um, that most people would obviously be up in flames. There was the parrot you heard. That <laughs> I heard that. Uh, he liked that. Um, and um, as as long as um, he was faithful to her and her promise was to protect him. And I mean, I have no idea where I came up with that story. Um, Is it kind of like a blessing and a curse? Because it doesn't look like it would be very easy to get out of this situation. Like you're comfortable. Yeah. But if you want to leave, like, good luck. It's probably a, I don't want to say a fatal attraction, but um yeah, if you get out of this situation, she's going to... And, and actually, that was in, on my mind. It was like, you know, um, you've heard that old saying. I'm trying to think of it. It goes, um, the, uh, a woman a woman must once scorned... Uh, there's nothing 
worse than a woman once scorned or something. There's no hell worse. Hell you know, have no theory. <laughs> yes, exactly. That that's it. You know, so as long as he's cool and he, as long as he respects Pele and the relationship, he's going to be just fine. But if he doesn't, uh, he's going to have some. He's going to have problem. <laughs> Dude, so okay, so I, I have, power, so. yeah, I have to ask. There's one thing about this painting that just like makes me laugh every time I see it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the life preserver. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why the life preserver? What is he gonna do with it? Ah, um, you know, I don't have an answer for that. You don't have an answer uh, for that. I like the, uh, the maybe little, maybe little that's an insurance policy for him. Maybe he and look at the little tea kettle. Yeah, yeah he's even lowering a tea kettle down to heat it up for his morning uh, cup of tea or or whatever. Um, you know, I, I I just sometimes I just let things go and uh, you know I always start with a story in my mind and then that tells me what to draw or paint because if I mean if you don't have a story in your brain. Um, uh, you, you know, you just do something that's pretty to the eyes, which isn't bad. I mean, there's a lot of artists who make money on eye candy alone, but uh, I always have to have a story that I want people to discover and uh, um, find things in it and that there could be a narrative, you know, behind the painting. I've got another one here. Uh, let's Mai Tai at the Moai. Uh huh. This that was done. Piece. That was a cover of an early uh, Tiki magazine, um, the original Tiki magazine. Um, With Otto? And uh, um, yeah. Um, and nothing too complicated about the story. It was just the idea of, of a little Tiki bar with a Moai entrance um, that you could go in there and, and sit down and have a, have a few cocktails. And, and it was a fantasy tropical environment surrounding it. See, I, so I, I saw it kind of differently, which I guess is why I love narrative art is because you can, it's not just like, like you said earlier, like, Oh, I really like this wave. That's why I put it on my Yeah. Wall. For me, when I looked at this, I was like, okay, you got this volcano going off. Like, this island's about to be destroyed. And, and whoever's uh -huh. here, uh, maybe they know that like impending doom is coming. And they were like, you know what? Let's just go to the uh, the Moai shack and uh, we'll have some cocktails <laughs> while the the fire descends upon us. So I, I think yeah, it's a know, much more aggressive light. <laughs> I love that. You know, and that's the thing about art um, that I love is when I do something, I may have a story in my mind. But, you know, I've sold an awful lot of different images, both, like I said, in the entertainment industry concepts. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ideas that may or may not make it off the ground. Um, but always somebody would would interpret something in a story wise in a way that really was more interesting to me. I mean, I like to allow that's why I don't put a lot of people in my artwork. Because I like, uh, not that I can't draw people, but uh, I like people to to um, have their own perception and experience, just like you said, and come up with their own story sometimes, you know? It's just, it's inspiration. And that's Walt Disney, um, that's what he used to have a lot of the artists do before an attraction was designed or whatever. It was called inspirational art. And it was put on the wall and a writer might look at it and one writer might interpret it one way, an architect might interpret it another way, a set designer. And um, it just, it's the first thing that, that's physical for everyone to look at and start to generate a story that inspires them um, uh, into the real world. I do also think sometimes it's harder to to put yourself into a situation when there are already people there. Yeah. You know, like 
Like if in your paintings, yeah. there are tons of people, I'm going to be focused on the people and less about like, how does this actually make me feel if I were exactly in the Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. So sometimes I don't put people on. Um, I'm sorry that I'm wearing these uh, shaded glasses. I'm not, I'm actually not trying to be cool. Um, it's too, because you were too cool for school. I, I can't. <laughs> it's because it's one of the. I, I haven't worn glasses most of my life. Most of my life, but these are bifocal, so I can see uh, tra or transitionals, wherever the uh, hell they're called. So I can see below and above, and they just happen to be slightly tinted because they help when I'm on the computer all day long. I don't get eye strain if I have this slight tint on there. So that's uh, that's very uh, unlike you, Thor. Otherwise, I'm not trying to make any kind of statement like, you know, like I wear sunglasses very, at 7 o'clock at night. Sunglasses at night? <laughs> that, that song's already been written. I am very surprised by that, though, because I would expect you, with all your stories, like, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is back when I did a sea voyage and I burned my retinas staring into the ah, lava. Ah, ah. <laughs> Luckily not. <laughs> Luckily my, not. My my retinas are luckily uh, uh, healthy. Uh, other than being, by the sea lion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got I got this one. So this is obviously uh, this is one of. I don't know. Dare I say like? Yeah. Magnum so that was a rough that sketch. Like. Yeah, that's what I would call a rough comp. Um, uh, when I was trying to figure out how to do a painting about the Contiki. Um, I did a rough sketch that gave me a feeling of the light and the composition. And so it's well, that that's what I would call a, a, a well, in the art world with painters and everything, they call them comps. And you're just trying to figure out where your composition is going to be, how to lead people's eye. And, you know, there's a, I've taught a lot of classes on uh, at the Art Center College of Design and different things like that about painting and uh, entertainment design and and I always talk about you know when you do these things you're there's there's so much into these that aren't random that if you're not an artist that draws or paints or does that you may not see it but everything has a purpose in in the painting that is directional. So the wings, uh, the wings of the flying fish on the lower left, um, are pointed on uh, one's on on the uh, you know upper part of its wings that's overlapping the contiki, and that actually becomes an. If you were to draw arrows as to where you want the audience, your audience to look, that's pointing you to look at the contiki. It's saying, look over here. And then that other uh, flying fish on the far right, it's actually, if you were to draw a curve or from its tail as it's supposedly come out of the water, and it's kind of curving up into the sky and saying, look up here and then curve your eye down to the sail and then look at the contiki and then, um, you know, follow it forward and and maybe the... the um, uh, you know, the dolphins are helping create a sense of motion as to where they're supporting the, you know, the boat, the, the raft going. And and then the last thing is the little secret things that you catch in the sky, which are all the, the actual tikis that are hidden in the clouds. The, that's so I believe, I think this looks uh, like Tangaroa to me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. This would be so Marcasian. You see, you see the yeah, and if you see the final painting, you see those subtly, but there's what's called first, second, and third readings, too. It's like, I always like to have a focal point, and I think that's important in anything you design, whether it be a tiki bar or anything. I mean, anyone can put stuff all over the place and hang it all over the place. But um, if you subliminally can control, and I don't mean in a, in a negative way, what people look at and how they look at it and in what order they look at it, um, that's actually composing um, as opposed uh, an, an image. It's composing a painting. And that's what 
all the masters used to do and everything that you, you might not ever notice, but there was a very um, definite um, per, way, approach that they, they took to uh, creating art. How do you go from, from your rough value comp to your more finished piece? Um, I, I've worked in every medium you can imagine. Um, a matter of fact, if you, you if you've watched me work in the past, people, um, fellow artists have laughed because I am not one of those guys that is neat and tidy in how I approach a painting. In other words, I don't have this perfect little palette laid out with all the colors and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I've literally sometimes, uh, if I get low on the water, then I'm rinsing my brush if I'm working in acrylics and, and the water is getting dirty. I'll dip into my coffee. <laughs> and you, and you, and put it. And you don't still drink the, the coffee, do you? No, that in that case, I don't. If I'm painting with rum, you bet I'll drink that rum. <laughs> but if I'm painting with coffee and I'm dipping the you know acrylics into it, but if I'm getting to the end of a painting and I don't feel like getting up there and rinsing out my paint water, I'll dip into my coffee. Um, so, uh, but I've painted in acrylics, oils, um, uh, you know, all kinds of. I, I draw in pencils, markers, and then I've re in, in the last uh, six years um, uh, taught myself the digital world um so i i can sketch digitally um on um uh on cintiq uh drawing pads and uh, ipads and things like that and my goal is always to make it look like i mean it, it and it actually takes a little bit of effort to to tweak them so that they act like they would if i was working with uh, water and ink or pencils and that kind of stuff but and that's and that's a you know so there's an example actually of something that i could have done in uh on a tone paper i used to work a lot on like the called canson paper which has a mid-tone so that okay so that kind of beige color yeah. i would have taken a black and a white prismacolor pencil and done that sketch um the same way but in this case, I did it digitally. I just put, I just created a neutral beige background, and then I drew with a black um, what I wanted, what I was trying to achieve. Sometimes, I mean, I'll often do an underdrawing, like an animator will do. An underdrawing being a really rough blue line, blue line, or a rough, you know, whatever. And then I'll clean it up, and then I'll uh, I'll use uh, a digital a stylus um, with uh, the tones, simple tones, uh, and just do it the same way. I mean, that kind of answers one of your questions about, um, and I don't know if I'm getting out of order from what you want. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe you, I should wait until you ask Maybe you shouldn't. me. About, <laughs> I, I don't know. About digital, now I may never uh, ask you. Oh, okay. you mean like 3D sculpting? Yeah. So, yeah, so this is definitely one thing that I want to talk to you about okay. um, in particular, uh, because obviously we talk about a lot of things on here, art, you know, cocktails, all kinds of stuff. But when it, you know, at the end of the day, my personal obsession is ceramic cocktail mugs. And right. um, I love so many different kinds of mugs. Um, and there is a like a, a debate, I would say, uh, within the tiki communities where where a lot of people put a huge emphasis on hand sculpted mugs which i love um this one that i'm drinking out of was hand sculpted and it's gorgeous um okay. patrick Vassar. um but in doing that they kind of put 3d sculpting in a negative light and there are a ton of benefits to working in 3d mm -hmm. and accomplishing things that you just can't do by hand uh, I know you work with 3D, so I wanted to kind of get your your thoughts on the pros of like, working with 3D. You could look at this. 
um, and, and you can't probably see it real well, but this was an early mug that was a shrunken head mug that I um, did a few years back. This was all done just in polymer clay. I just took a ball of polymer, polymer clay and uh, aluminum foil ball and then worked over the top of it. And it's got, you can't really see, but it's got a tremendous amount of detail to it. Um, and uh, that's all, I mean, I've done, a, I used to do a lot of them, what they call maquettes. Um, for the characters and the different things um, at, when I was with Disney for rides and, and attractions. Um, so I've worked in wax and clay and wood. And uh, matter of fact, you don't have to get into it, but I, I, one of the pictures I sent you was when I was 10 years old, my grandfather, uh, an avid outdoorsman, had me uh, carving scenes into into the butt of his rifles so i was carving on in walnut um uh different things i mean the the first the only one i sent you was like the really simple one when i was probably 10 or, or about 11 no i was more like 11 yeah and that doesn't look simple to me <laughs> well it, it, i mean uh, first i learned checkering which is on the grip and then i learned to carve the scenes um so I've been sculpting a long, long time in a lot of different mediums. Um, and when I, I resisted digital stuff for a long time, but then I was like, okay, cause there's some technical aspects you have to crunch. You have to, you have to have a technical mind uh, as well as an artistic mind uh, to crunch the, the uh, transitions. And, um, I would say that it's the same comparison as, as if I were to say any tiki carver out there that carves uh, uh, panels or, or, or full on tikis, um, that if you don't use a hand chisel and a hammer, you're cheating or you're, vet, you're, you're not valid and I won't buy your work. If you use a chainsaw or a Dremel tool, you're, you're uh, you're cheating well digital stuff is the same way i mean i have to know how to sculpt in order to use a digital sculpting uh tool to sculpt what i sculpt now um it's not it, it, any it's not easy i i it's not easy. I, it's i've not tried easy. zbrush and it's, it's no. hard man <laughs> and, and matter of fact i've got a good friend who's a uh highly regarded orthopedic surgeon who went through the same argument in surgery that, uh, you know, now that they use, um, uh, can't, um, what do they call them? Um, orthoscopic, orthoscopic scopes and all that kind of stuff to, to go in and, um, do minimal invasive surgery on a knee or something like that. That a lot of the old, the, some surgeons are like, well, that's cheating. You know, and we, we used to just cut open the knee and do it the old fashioned way. Um, <laughs> It's the I don't same care argument. how you fix my knee, just fix my knee. <laughs> yeah. Um, pe people people that, um, that don't like, I mean, there are some people who are digital sculptors that it looks like it, it has a sterile look, okay? And it's because they have not learned uh, the fundamentals of sculpting um, the traditional way. And so that tool you could say is abused and is, and is a, uh, a they, they've uh, enabled themselves to do something they would never have been able to do without the technology that, that is presented to them, to them now. Um, that's the same with Photoshop and any other program. But um, if you're just like back to the thing about the um, Tiki Carver, um, if you if you use the tool, the chainsaw, the grinder, the the uh, Dremel uh, to speed up the process of something where in the end you're going to end up with something that looks the same, but you're doing it in a tenth of the time. What it allows you to do is make more things. It allows you to take more of your ideas and get them out there 
than it would uh, to do without that technology. So it's foolish to, um, to judge that technology, and especially in these times. I mean, uh, anyone who, who says that, you know, they won't buy a mug that was digitally sculpted if they find out, you know, is just, I'm sorry, but they're ignorant of that fact um, because it is hard still. And, and you still have to have a design sense um, and you still have to know how to use that tool properly. So, so uh, I just, and, and when it's done well, it's very, very hard to tell the difference. It's, um, you're I, one of those artists, I, guarantee, uh, I guarantee you, I can do something. I can sculpt anything that I could have sculpted the other way and trick you into thinking I did it with a ball of clay. The only difference is I didn't have to build an archer. I didn't have to get ruin my clothes, uh, getting full of <laughs> paint and uh, resin and um, all that other yeah. kind of crap. Yeah. Well, um, in that regard, 3D is cheating because you're a messy artist. I am. So there, it's just cleaning uh, your workspace uh, yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I my my mom when I was going through art school, I think I ruined her sink. I ruined. Uh, you know, many tab tablecloths and uh, all this kind of stuff. Because uh, I I just went for it. But the, the, the idea was the end product. That when people looked at something that they were amazed by it. And how I got there, no one knew. Uh, I, I just, you know, I just haven't really focused on being, uh, you know, neat and tight. I don't want to say neat and tidy. I don't want to say that. I just, it's just that. You know, you do what you have to do to get to a something that's going to give somebody an amazing experience. And uh, it's really none of their business how you got there. Um, you, what you want to do is you want to entertain them and you want to enchant them. And uh, as, as so a good... I, it's artist. just different different tools. Like when you go yeah. on a, a theme park, attract, I'm a theme park nerd. I love like yeah. reading about new technology and stuff. Um, sure. But at the end of the day, as a guest, you shouldn't really be able to tell how they've done something if they've done their yeah. job correctly. You should just be like, you're Holy absolutely cow, right. that's insane. And it's yeah. kind of the same with mugs. I know. So like this is an example. Mike Biggs, uh, which we're giving this away later. Uh, second edition. Oh, Maseratu awesome. mug. Mike Biggs is a 3D artist. Uh, he sculpts, yeah. you know, with computers and then he, he's able to print them out and make stuff. And you would not, looking at this, I, 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 you know, I would be hard pressed to find anyone be able to say, "Hey, this is 3D." You know, you no, wouldn't I know mean, it you could, it's done yeah, very well. Yeah, I mean, there's no if you're if you know what you're doing, um, like that mug. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, like you you know, um, you know, Squid who used to do all yep. the. Uh, uh, Dave Cohen. He, he um, Dave is, you know, I've, he's been a friend for many years. I mean, and um, he could do things, you know, with with wax and and with different things like that that would look just like that. And you you wouldn't know that the difference. Um, it's just that he has his medium that he prefers, and um, we all, you know, as an artist, if if you use your tools responsibly be you a carver or be you a, mu a musician who uses modern technology and how they mix their music. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and anyone who, who judges otherwise, and I say this in a friendly way, is just ignorant of the uh, facts um, of that. So that's how one I of the on. other, other things um, about 3d. So here's one that I think you uh -huh. sculpted. Um, so this yeah. is a rendering, right, of the computer. It's not the actual mug. Right. Um, it, well, you can see some insane detail here. But another thing about the mug is oftentimes, as mugs become more and more complicated, um, sometimes the the hull that you're drinking out of uh, becomes smaller or awkward or this, that, and the other thing on different mugs. And one of the right. things that 3D allows you to do is you can print it at a certain size. And yes. uh, if you need to increase the size, you just print it again. 
Whereas yes. if you hand sculpted something, there is no way to, to go back without redoing the entire thing. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, the toy industry um, and many other industries have adopted this technology because of those facts. There, You can be so much more responsible as a designer um, that is doing something that's going to be a real thing and a real product and a functional product um, that it's hard to beat, you know? So, yeah. I didn't, I didn't even, so you sent me this photo. I didn't even know you worked on this one. Yeah. So that's such um, a... You know, I was, I was um, sculpting a heck of a lot, or actually I, I shouldn't say sculpting. I did at the end, but I was with Tiki Farm for about, roughly three years as their creative director there. And um, that was just one of our jobs. And um, early on, I would just have to do these really tight drawings like this, and they would be sent overseas for a sculptor to emulate and um, try to sculpt what I drew. And sometimes they came out pretty close sometimes they didn't um but i didn't have my hand in on uh sometimes you know and actually sculpting them so um you know all honesty sometimes i liked what they came up with sometimes i didn't I, uh, uh you know it's just is it more I, is it like is it easier or more difficult sculpting someone else's design um it's fun because you know who everyone gets bored with themselves, right? I mean, if you look at yourself in the mirror every day, eventually, unless you're an extreme narcissist, um, you get bored looking at yourself and, and, and uh, seeing the same thing. So when I get a chance to try to get into the head of another artist and have the privilege of sculpting in 3d their vision that they have drawn or that they have described to me it's really 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 refreshing and, it, and i learn something every time you know from from another person's perspective another artist's perspective do you have to constantly be aware um so like you've made mugs so you're you know yeah. undercuts in the mold making process and pieces and pulling away do you right. often get designs that like the artist is not necessarily aware of the undercuts and then you have to take the them time. and then how, how does that process work? Um, I just, I just say, Hey, um, let me rough out what I think will work for you and, and, and get your feedback. And, um, it works really well because they, they go, Oh, okay. I get it. Um, you know, and yeah, I'm fine with that. Or you, you know, you've actually made it, work where I wouldn't have, you know, where I know how, how to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I, and that's what I do, but I do it respectfully because, you know, um, I'm not going to take over so much that I, I'm going to change someone's design so much that it just is my own. You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to maintain the integrity of, of what they're trying to achieve as an artist. Um, and I do that a lot. I mean, I mean, I, I honest to God, um, I've probably sculpted. I don't, I can't say a thousand mugs, but I was going to say, do you have any idea how many mugs you've, uh, you've I can't even count at I mean, this point. Many, 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 many hundreds of mugs and many of them. I don't even take credit for. I mean, I I'm also a ghost sculptor for a lot of artists and a lot of companies and I'm fine with that. I'll just say, I'll knock this out for you. You, you know, you pay me for my time and I'm out of here, you know, and uh, you don't need my name on it. Some people want my name on it and other, in other cases, you know, I respect the fact that, and I would rather have the artist have the uh, uh, credit and the, uh, um, because it's their vision, you know, and all, and I play the man behind the curtain, you know, 
And um, and I'm used to well, that. you must be I used mean, to that from your experience with Walt Disney Imagineering. Yeah, I mean, like, I've always yeah, exactly. Sometimes you get credit, often you don't. You you have to you have to know that, and sometimes you, it's hard to watch other people stand up at the podium and take credit for things that you did, you know, and that they they surround themselves with the best talent they can. Um, and it makes them look good. Uh, and, uh, you just shut up and, but you, you know. it's, it's still gotta be pretty cool. Like when you go and you see something that you worked on and you see other people oh, yeah. enjoying it, you know, even sure. if, even if they're not aware that yeah. you did it, it's still like, it is. And, and it's the most moments. rewarding thing ever to watch, to just be in, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, an observer amongst everybody else and watch people's reactions, you know, um, it's one of the most rewarding things ever. Um, and, you know, I, I tell people that, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, this is a mantra of mine about just life itself is like, you know, I, I think one of the greatest things that ever gives you fulfillment is to do a good deed. Um, or do something good for someone else and or or a situation a random acts of kindness and you don't need to tell anybody about it um that's that's not really where the where the reward really is they don't need to know about it uh, you know you just do it and you know you you've changed somebody's life or you've made a a, a difference you know in a, in a world that doesn't always have good things happening all the time, you know? And you just feel good too. I mean, sometimes as an artist, like, it's hard to kind of lose sight of when you, when you've been picking at the same sculpt for like the eighth revision and it's, you know, monotonous and all the, the, mm -hmm. the joy that the design once brought you has now been like sucked from your soul. <laughs> yeah. To then it's go and like, see. You know, when I, yeah. Like when I designed journey to the center of the earth or any of the stuff uh, for Disney, um, I had been through that ride in my brain and in, and, and with the model makers and with the set designers and with the special effects guys and the architects and the engineers and all that kind of stuff so many times that by the time the thing actually opened, which I didn't even go to the opening, um, I was tired of it. I, I didn't want to see it. I didn't even want to ride it. Um, because I was, I had been on it a thousand times <laughs> and, um, you know, so sometimes that happens, you know, and, uh, but, but you get joy out of seeing other people experience it for the first time. All right. Let me ask you this. We're, we're beyond an hour. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's still a lot of, yeah, we haven't even talked about Disney Imagineering. Are you okay on time? If we keep at pounding you with questions or it's totally up to you. Up? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how many people are even uh, right now. We got seven, 71 people watching. Okay. I'm, I, so, I, I, I'm here um, for you. And, if you're and game, I'll keep people. asking you questions because I'm having a good time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I saw this. Um, you mentioned Holden earlier. Um, 13 yeah. nights of Tiki Frights is actually sponsored by Tiki farm. They're sponsoring all of our mug giveaways. And you sent me a picture. Um, Holden's a good friend. I saw the picture and I was like, I, I need to know. I need to know the story behind this. <laughs> what is happening well, when in this I picture? First came on, when I first came on board with Tiki Farm, I just kind of created these a series of sketches where, and, and it's funny because I didn't know what Holden's reaction was going to be or anything like that, but I was like, why don't, why don't we kind of make the Tiki Farm mysterious, as mysterious as Willy Wonka's um, chocolate factory, and and that 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 there could be the, these I called them um, Mugahoonies. Um, Mugahoonies of, right over here. <laughs> yeah, and um, and they and inside here they were growing literally harvesting um ceramics and and mugs were growing on trees and these mugahoonies were uh, a part of it and then that boat is kind of like the boat that you see gene wilder on uh, when he eventually goes into that tunnel but 
I had Holden at the helm there and uh, uh, he was driving it and uh, it was <laughs> it was a whole series of, of drawings that were uh, focused on um, uh, Tiki Farm being sort of like the Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, but of making ceramics. And uh, we never did anything with it, really. I think it was maybe, uh, as a matter of fact, for fun. Uh, to, to his credit. When I said, why don't we publish this and, and make a big deal about it? Uh, Holden said, you know, um, I, I, I kind of don't want to make a big deal about myself. Uh, I'd rather just kind of keep it on the down low. I, I, I'm, I'm not that comfortable. And he didn't say he was shy, but he said, you know, I'm, I, don't, I, I, I could tell he wasn't as that comfortable about making that big of a deal about himself and the company that we went this far. So one day, one day yeah. we'll get a, a Tiki farm book and uh, fingers crossed for that day. But I just, I, I saw this and I laughed and I just, I guess because like in talking to all these artists and knowing how much a pain in the ass ceramics is, yeah, like it's brutal. Uh, you have That's to be really passionate about it. Otherwise, ceramics will break you. And so just it this will. idea that you could be on a boat, you know, and just picking tiki mugs, you know, <laughs> uh, if, if only you could do that, just put a little seed in the ground and then you'd have, you know, this beautiful Thor tiki mug masterpiece. <laughs> up here. Yeah. Yeah. It was really uh, my own self entertainment more than anything else. I, I, you know, I'll draw things that are sometimes that are just ideas in my head for my own entertainment, just like I did, I get, you know, when I was a kid. Um, I think that's what started me on art is my mom said that to keep you entertained and keep you out of mischief, we would sit you at the kitchen table with a stack of white paper and pencils, and you would sit there for hours drawing things. And then you weren't you know, getting into trouble and, you know, anything else. And um, so I think. <laughs> Did anyone I else in I, your family draw? My mom um, is a fabulous artist. Matter of fact, we have, we would sit for hours drawing and, and we would laugh hysterically because we'd have some experience somewhere where some funny person we'd come across. Um, uh, or a relative, you know, that we want to make fun of, not in a bad way, <laughs> but, they, but, but, but we would draw them and we would draw them in these funny scenarios. And my mom got me started doing that. And we would sit and just laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and draw and draw. And matter of fact, I've got a huge box full of sketches going back to those times of all these people and these scenarios. And when I look at the stack of drawings to this day, I mean, I, I just laugh hysterically. Howl with laughter. <laughs> yeah. At, at Uncle Charlie or at uh, all of our, you know, goofy relatives, um, we would just laugh forever. And uh, it was pretty special. And my, you know, my mom is a fabulous artist. Um, so she, I have to give her credit for, and, and all my family at that time for encouraging me. My grandfather too for, um, on my mom's side, it, you know, I'd ask for things for my uh, GI Joes or whatever. And he'd go, okay, well, you want an airplane for GI Joe? I go, yeah, yeah. He go, And he was a carpenter at one point, a merchant marine and a, um, you know, U.S. Coast Guard captain and a very capable man's man. And he'd go, okay, we'll draw it up and let's see what we can do to make it. And so I learned early that if I could envision something and draw it, that there was a good chance it was going to become something physical. Something, you physical. know? Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Is that is that like the early seeds of Disney Imagineering in you? Yeah. I definitely, I definitely think so, because um, that's that that was all of what Disney Imagineering was. Is, you know, sometimes they'd lock us in a room, and uh, there would be me, a writer, 
sometimes or me and a couple of artists and and uh, and and paper all over the conference room table and marking pens and things and we'd be in there for the entire day and i, I have to that's admit, exhausting wow. well it would get way off topic i mean we would we would laugh and we would draw stuff that we would have probably gotten fired for if they ever saw what we were doing but we would just we for putting laugh. it into the ether <laughs> yeah we would make fun of executives we would we would do all this stuff but in the end of the day we'd have this uh cork board or we'd have a, a wall with tape and a, and a ton of drawings and ideas and notes all over it and everyone just you know we do our job but how we got there, if people could watch us, they would probably say, boy, you guys were just a, look like a bunch of high school, you know, kids. I think I think that kind of that that mentality has changed to an extent over time in regards to yeah. like work, work structured work. And Disney I probably yeah. played a huge role in this, uh, but like Google, Apple headquarters, all of these places now give people their employees intentional time to like do their own things yeah and and to like have exercise equipment on property because that's right. where like anytime you're doing something creative um you don't just sit down and like i'm going to have a good idea now you kind of have right. to like go through hours of that process of just throwing stuff at the walls and seeing what sticks yeah so, and sometimes you don't know where it's gonna go and sometimes it ends up you know one person will have some stupid idea not stupid idea but some goofy idea that just triggers and it it, it it becomes a catalyst of a whole chain of other ideas you know and and that's the importance of <clears throat> and and not that everyone has to draw but um i've always been able to draw and and it was a it's always been a very powerful uh thing in any meeting i've been in because when everyone's scratching their head sometimes i'll draw something and like you said earlier, maybe I had a different intention, but it triggers the writers. It triggers um, other people, you know, that that have a whole other interpretation of where the concept can go. And uh, that's the, the power of the pencil, you know, being able to visually create, take that white piece of paper that's flat and make it into a, into a foggy three-dimensional um, thing that people can look into and see something and, um, and, and riff on it, you know? So I have pulled up here, um, journey to the center of the earth. Oh, um, oh, you found my old storyboards. Yeah. I found some old storyboards. Yeah. How do you even begin designing an attraction? Like, that um, seems like Journey such a daunting the, task. Yeah, you know, they, Disney stole me, I'll admit it, from Universal <laughs> Studios at the time. Uh, they, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and they said they have an e-ticket attraction that needs to be designed, and they gave me um, an awful lot of freedom. They said, you know, the only thing about Journey to Center of the Earth for Tokyo Disney Seas that we have on, on reference other than some previous concepts that were done for a studio tour are um, Pat Boone's movie about Journey to the Earth and the book. And so I, not being someone who has a lot of patience with reading entire books or anything like that, I, I breezed through it and then I made up everything. And um, so the style and everything, you know, was something I totally created. So it really was, if I look back on it, if I had thought about it, that they were putting me in the responsibility of designing a potentially 130 million or more dollar e-ticket attraction, um, maybe, you know, maybe I would have gotten a little more nervous but i didn't i just went for it and i had ideas and I, I and i just drew and i drew and i drew and i sculpted and i drew and um the the attraction is 
a rem remarkably still um, popular today um, in Japan. Uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth in Tokyo Disney Seas is is a very um, well regarded e ticket attraction, and uh, they're talking uh, about expanding it actually from uh, like the yeah. whole sea universe. Maybe yeah. making movies on that and bringing more of that stuff. It goes back to that whole right. adventuring thing and the Jungle Cruise that they've kind of like rethemed slightly mm -hmm. um, to the Society yeah. of Explorers and Adventurers. Did that exist before Tokyo Disney Sea, or was that the? Well, there was the, there was, was the, the Adventurers program? Club and other things like that. Uh, of course, the Jungle Cruise, and there was other things, but uh, um. Yeah, I'm not sure what else would have existed at the time. Um, and, you know, our technology was different then. I mean, we're talking mid-90s. Um, so I wasn't, I drew and hand, I hand drew, I hand sculpted, I hand did everything. Um, all my animation drawings for the animatronic figures and the characters and everything, I hand Drew and I got up there and, and had to present to Michael Eisner and everybody at the time um, on the team. Um, and uh, I would just go into a storytelling mode, you know. And uh, and uh, when, when you get me going um, <laughs> in a story, no, I have no, I had no idea. <laughs> I, I kind of just kind of like. I don't even know who's out there anymore. I just get into the story and I get so absorbed into, into telling a story that, um, you know, they told me it sold, you know, everybody uh, on the, on the direction and the style and everything. And then, you know, I art directed it all the way, through, all the way up to the point of installation and a good friend of mine named Gwen Ballantyne took over and did the um, uh, installation art direction on all that kind of stuff. And um, that was when I was transitioning out of Disney and into my own thing. And uh, so, you know, that's just what it was. But I designed a lot of other things for Disney at the time. I mean, you gotta remember that you would, you would be amazed at how many things are conceptualized at these companies, Disney, Universal Studios, everything that never make it to being built. I'd, I mean, I would, I would say my experience was like ten percent, and that's probably generous of all the ideas uh, ever made it to actuality that that you would experience. I've got some pictures here of, of things that are ride attractions, but I don't know what they are other than these pictures. Uh, yeah, it looks amazing. A, Let's see yeah, this see, one. I, like, I what's going on a, with this one? I gave you a plethora of things to look at. Typically, this is the type of images that I present, you know, on all these things. This was something totally, this was a, where they presented me a, ride uh technology um of this thing i can't remember what they called it a kuka arm or something like yeah. that and where people would be able to be pushed in and out of different set work and um this was for for a project in china um dealing with the monkey king which is a famous story in there and uh, they asked me to storyboard it out as to what the different scenes would be. And um, me and a writer worked together and I just illustrated what I felt would be um, the experience for the uh, um, person who went on this ride. And uh, so this is a typical concept. Uh, piece this thing is absolutely person. gorgeous, dude. Well, thank you. That, I'm well, like, thank I want this to exist. That's that's the problem with you you drying these and putting them into the ether is that they don't exist. And now I'm like, my life's not complete. Yeah, you know, so the hard this. part is that I, I I would have to sit down sometimes with the finance guys at Disney, and they'd say, because they were estimating the cost of the attraction. So how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? 
what what are they looking at is that three-dimensional is that whatever and, and so you know half the time i'd make it up but but i knew it was possible and i'd say that's going to be a rear screen projection that's going to be a set flat that's going to be three-dimensional piece the uh, frp fiberglass or whatever it is in the foreground but then as we go back it's going to become a psych it's going to become a, a, a set piece or a, um a, an illuminated um mural and um so when i draw something i don't just make up a a, a pretty picture um I'm, i often was put into the responsibility of saying how okay this looks great but how are we going to do this so let's talk uh, about let's um let's use this one as an example so what's going same on in one. This one? That's, from, that's from the same attraction so you can see the kuka arm thing that you would not uh, be aware of. That the kuka arm thing was a engineering device not used for rides or things, but in the past, but that could be used to put a bunch of people on a uh, a seating arrangement where you can push them up and down and in and out, almost like a a simulator um, and uh, this was another scene from the monkey king where they went uh i don't remember the name of this scene but they were in the palace and the monkey king uh would have been done in a combination of uh probably um pr projection and uh high resolution projection and animatronics and different and fog machines and uh different things like that. And uh, that's what that represents. It's to, get, it's to get everyone's brains started. And so engineers, architects, uh, set designers, they'll all look at these things and they'll, they'll start to get ideas on how to accomplish that experience from that image. I want to, uh, if it's okay, let's do a quick giveaway here to the okay. people that are watching. Pull this up. Here's going to be the question. Okay. So Slash this month. Oh, you just messed up the question. Oh, sh oh. <laughs> it was going to be what was what is this mug called? Thor, Thor, I'm Thor. Sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. Well, we're still going to give away a pin, even if Thor ruined it for everyone. And this is the ah. the Beazle, Beazle Buddy from the Black Lagoon Room and also a Swizzle Stick from the Black Lagoon Room. And let's see, what should the question be? Um, how, um, how about um, something to do with... Uh, let me think. Um, what did, did an astronaut ever... Well, that's a yes or no question. Um, is you know, uh, but it could be. Um, uh, did an astronaut ever do a spacewalk um, like this on a, on a single mission without another astronaut present? Do you know the answer to this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the question. So people are starting to answer. Whoever gets it right, we'll get this uh, Beazle Buddy pin and a swizzle stick. And we, there are two options. We've had people say yes or no. So, Thor, what is the correct answer? Well, from my understanding, the, uh, the, the, the spacewalk was done on the Gemini um, uh, mission. There was two astronauts in the space capsule. So, one went out and did a spacewalk on the umbilical cord while the other stayed inside. But that what I did on this mug is I kind of simulated the early um, uh, um, you know uh, what, what was it? You know, some of the, er the one of the early uh, missions um, where they were going out there uh, and they'd have a single uh, guy um uh go up in a space capsule and uh you know it's a lot more risky to go out on your 
own uh, and uh, um, in case something goes wrong uh, than it is to have a buddy inside that, uh, you know, could yank on your cord and get you back in the space capsule. So my understanding from from people who have supposedly more information than I have is that what I did probably could not have ever happened because um, I'm, I'm uh, you know, insinuating it's just one dude that decides to go out the window and do a spacewalk. Uh, so the answer would be no? Correct. In which case, the winner of the pin would be Ted. Ted, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Ted. Ted Marr. But uh, congratulations. Uh -huh. You're taking home a uh, you're taking home a pin and a swizzle stick from the Black Lagoon Room. Yeah. Do, 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 do. All right, I got another piece of uh, concept art pulled up for you. This one. Uh, well, you asked me the question: What is one attraction that I designed at Disney that uh, I wish had become a reality that never did? Um, it was. The concept I came up with called the Undersea Grand Prix. It was going to be a simulator. Imagine being in a simulator like Star Tours, but this entire thing took place underwater and that it was a strange kind of, well, now they call it steampunk a little bit, but this was what I would call retro future um, in a way. Um experience where you raced other submarine you were in a race with other submarines uh, uh of this style and that was the starting line you see the laser going across the thing there that's the starting line and once that laser went off that you were in that whale on the bottom of the uh gondola on the bottom of the whale you were in one of those, and you saw that when you went into the queue line, a physical uh, built one when you went in there. So it felt like you thought that's where you were. And the whole race took place, and it was a, it was a wild concept that actually I just went crazy with. Uh, there was tons of drawings um, and, and stuff on this and designs for uh, various uh, submarines. Um, but um, what happened, um, even though Disney themselves loved it, um, internally, everyone was really excited about it. But the client we were working with, Oriental Land Company at the time, said that there was too much humor in it. And uh, that ah. in their estimation, there. And, and I'll just use the exact words I was told. Um, stuff underwater and sea creatures are not that funny. So they didn't s resonate with the, the concept of the story and the whole thing. So it got canned. But um, I had a great time, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah, coming I'm, up with I'm kind of bummed with that one. That looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, what about what about this one? The industry. Oh, that was um, Flight of the Birdman. Was a uh, I was asked to come up with a. Again, sometimes they presented me with an engineering um, technology. This was a um, a thing where people, when you went, uh, imagine a roller coaster where you lay down as you're going up the up ramp before you go down, and you're laying down going up head first um and then then you're suspended it was a suspended roller coaster and um i can't and but it had to go into an adventure land like foresty environment um and this was one of the things i was like what do you do with people when they're laying down like this for a minute or whatever it took to get to the top of the apex before you start to drop. And so I put everybody through these interrogating situations where they were going through a rite of passage. And that one of them was that 
these gorillas were trying to pull away the thatch that was above you and and reach out at you and get at you and um, all these things. You were put through a rite of passage of bravery before you could go on the ride and become an official um, uh, birdman. Uh, and it was Flight of the Birdman. Sounds so cool. Do you, when you're designing these, do they... Do they like tell you like we're thinking about putting an attraction in Magic Kingdom? We're thinking about putting, a, or is it all kind of yeah. like sometimes on a need to know basis? Um, sometimes, sometimes I would know there's just a new ride tech engineering technology that they have and they need an application for it. So I would come up with a story and uh, you know come up with these images. Um, so other times, you know, it would be more or less specific. Sometimes a writer would already have a story written out and I would just illustrate it. Other times there was nothing at all other than the technology presented to me. And I had to come up with my own story and my own images and my own, you know, idea of how it could apply. Do you prefer the openness as an artist or do you prefer like direct? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd say if, if you were to cast me, uh, you know, where, where I fit best is I'm a, I'm, I, I've always been comfortable in what for some people, some artists is the scariest part. And that is, you don't know that much. You're given a white piece of paper and you're stuck in a, you're put in a, a room and you're, <laughs> And you're said, and you're told, come up with something really cool and interesting. And we have no idea what that is. But all we That's a lot of people's worst work. nightmare. Yeah. So that's where I always um, excelled. Because I actually, unless it was a detail that I could jump in on, um, I start to lose patience with, uh, and that's why it would often be handed over to another uh, art director. Um, but, and that was my choice, um, is because, you know, once I'm done with something, I want to move on to something else. And, uh, I don't want to sit for three years, um, with something that's already been in my head and, and, and just go through it for three years until it's built. Um, I want to come up with something new. And I think that's what brought me to the mug making industry is that I can come up with an idea and it becomes something made in a matter of months rather than years. And um, it was, and that was exciting for me because it means more and more and more ideas can become something physical for everyone to enjoy. Did you have a hard time like handing things off? Like this is your mm -hmm. design, your baby, and now other artists are gonna take it and do whatever? No. Doesn't bother you? No, I learned early on not to be um, possessive or in, too invested in my ideas. Uh, to this day, I'm that way. With with my team um, at Tiki Land, everything like that, uh, I, uh, I I more than welcome everyone else's ideas. Nobody's idea, if it's a good idea, there's no one who who is in, you know, cannot come up with a good idea, and um, it can be anybody. Um, every, everyone has great ideas. Um, maybe sometimes they can't express it. Um, just like if you were to say, you know, like for me, I I have a a, a musical mind and I have songs mm -hmm. in my head, but uh, I don't play an instrument, so I can't play you the song. But, um, you know, everyone's got a great idea and I'm more than happy to be part of a team. I'm very much a team player and uh, the ego just I don't have that ego where uh, uh, I'm possessive, um, you know, of that concept. I hear something that I think is all you. I think it's just your your personal love passion. Yeah. Project. The, the yeah, that's a backyard garden I'm work. I've been working on. 
<laughs> That's uh oh god. Um I, I wanted to create an herb garden in the backyard, but I wanted but I with all my trips to Japan and, and my and my fascination with Japanese culture and food um and everything. Um these were uh, monks um that were snails. And um, because I want to create all these characters that are going to be in a miniature, a miniature uh, herb garden in my backyard. <clears throat> and that's another one. Of yeah, she she is a cricket, and yet she's like a geisha, and um, that was a concept sketch for a geisha cricket in a little tea house that could serve tea to the hummingbirds. I think I have. So is this? It looks like it came to life here. And that's how it came to life. <clears throat> there she is, and I, I sculpted that, and um, she's now offering um, tea to the hummingbirds to come and share with her. That's got to be so fun to just, you know, kind of like, oh, I'm going to make an herb garden, but I want to make it so extra. You must have the most extra herb garden of anyone anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, um, some people, I mean, and I say this conservatively, but, you know, the, we, we have uh, people in the community that can be sometimes uh, brutal and uh, cruel. And, uh, and I don't, and, I, and I'm not going to elaborate, but on the same hand, um, you know, people have said to me, what the hell does this have to do with Tiki? You know, when I've posted things like this, but it all has to do with Tiki because Tiki is escapism. It's, it's creating a happy place. It's creating a laughing place. It's creating um, stories and, and places you'd rather be than what's going on in the world at the time. And um, so, you know, Tiki is 10% of all the other interests I have. Well, 25%. And um, everyone should be open-minded to that, as well as um, what part of Tiki they celebrate. You know, um, there can be traditional Tiki that happened in the mid-century. There can be, and, and but there's other people coming into the into the Tiki world right now that, um, have written me that said they've gotten brutal, sorry, just brutal uh, experiences, you know, from people saying, yeah, your, your thing isn't tiki, it's this and that. Or but, and, and I understand that there was a linear uh, um, sort of um, history that, that, that is archived. Um, uh, and as, as to how, you know, what we call tiki uh, came to be. But on the same hand, um, I really enjoy seeing people inspired by that, but that now in our current context, um, our current world, um, have something to say back again in their own way that uh, adds to that. And it actually add, it, it, it creates the longevity for all of us, for the for for us for for Tiki to keep going, rather than become um, something that is just nullified and no longer, uh, you know, validated as, as as something of the current world. So um, I, I always encourage everyone's ideas. I think everyone should be respectful of the, the linear. Um, uh, mid-century uh, involvement of Tiki, but on the same hand, um, I think there should be nobody. You'll never see me as an artist getting on social media and telling someone that their interpretation is invalid. I, I mean, uh, I'll never humiliate anybody. I will never say your fantasy is not my fantasy and I'm gonna blow out your candle. I think that everybody has, you know, a right to enjoy it the way that resonates with them the most. 
I do have to say, dude, uh, on a personal note, a uh, 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 thank you. Um, which I don't know if you're even aware of this, um, but I had a mug uh, that I worked on with Kim Bang, uh, which was a cat butt. We can yeah. actually pull it up for the people that, <laughs> that are curious about yeah, it. Yeah, I love it. Here's my cat butt mug. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Um, and if you have yeah, a cat, you know that cats awesome. put their butt everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I, so I got, I got literal like hate messages from, I would say dozens of people, um, saying that yeah. it was the end of Tiki and that, you know, I had, <laughs> I had ruined Tiki and like, I created the search for Tiki website, which is about mugs. Like I live and breathe Tiki. I love Tiki. I wouldn't create something that I thought yeah. was going to end Tiki for me. Um, my grandfather, uh, when I was growing up, served in in the war world war ii um and i can remember you know being in his house and he'd bring out these uh dirty i would say dirty jokes even though i was like maybe seven years old I remember, yeah, I remember. Match, match book and you flip it open yeah. and there'd be like genitalia and stuff in it and they were really crude mm -hmm. jokes but like it made him <laughs> laugh and he loved them yeah and tiki yeah. is very much a uh, it is very much related to war for better or worse in its current arcane in incarnation um because yeah. the veterans that went and served you know across the seas they wanted to take home some of what you know were the good parts of perhaps right. serving in a, in a very unfortunate situation and they yeah. you know they got some humor to get through the day with these dirty jokes so when Correct. we made a cat butt for me that was kind of like the sailor jerry aesthetic where it's like yeah. it's supposed to be cheeky and funny, and yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I saw you. You had posted some messages, and they may may not have been related. Um, but in a time when I was getting a lot of negativity, uh, you wow. said some very positive things, and it did make a difference. Well, so, well, thank you, thank you, and, and I believe that, and, and I, I, I love Kim, and I love, I, I thought the mug was fun and I mean, I'm a big cat person anyway so I got a kick out of it. <laughs> I don't but, know where my cat uh, is. He usually shows up. He signals the end of the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah I, I think the message in the, end, in the end, no pun intended, is that uh, uh, one of the fundamental reasons I got into Tiki way back was because People seem to be just so willing to accept each other's um, creativity and their interpretations and their everything that it was so refreshing. It was just, it was such a relief from the everyday world of, uh, that we live in, in the news and in politics and in, um, in our social lives. Um, and I think um, the most disheartening thing I ever experience is, where, is when I see that start to decay in our community, because it's so important. I mean, we're, look, we're, we're all alive at the same time right now. I mean, for our whatever, how many years we're all going to live. And we're experiencing this resurgence together. And um, why we do anything to to um, blow out anybody else's candle? Why? I mean, we 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 should really, really, really uh, celebrate each other and enjoy each other's visions and learn from each other's visions and be open-minded and uh, and enjoy it. It's our one relief from all the other crap that's going on right now in our world. That's what it is supposed to be. Right. It's escapism, right? Like that's the whole it point is. of it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you don't have the escapism, and unfortunately, that's one of the things that like, even though something might happen and, and, and you want to say something about it, like anything negative, whatever it is, anything negative yeah. will hurt someone else's immersive experience, right? Yes. Because- you're supposed to go into yes. the bar and forget all that stuff. That's what it is. Exactly. Like being immersed is when, you know, at Dawn is, is making it rain outside, even though it's not actually raining because he wants you to stay in and drink more cocktails. Yeah. 
know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I'm 100% so about that. So you'll never that. see me you'll never see me pee in anybody's punch bowl. Um I don't care who they are. I mean, I'll defend myself. I've been in situations online before where I've had to defend myself or I've defended my friends and and that's just who I am. If you're my friend, you I'm going to have your back. And uh I believe in the people I'm associated with on all levels professionally and personally and uh, uh, you're going to draw your sword on me I'm going to I'm going to take my sword out of the hilt and I'm going to defend myself swashbuckling um, sword exactly <laughs> yeah. but but on the same hand if but I'm going to do everything I can to to give you a hug at the same time <laughs> and and not hurt you so uh, Thor's giving you a hug and running you through at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt so bad. So anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thanks. With that said, buddy, we are approaching two hours. So I do oh, think wow. it's time to kind of wrap things up. I have one more okay. thing I want to talk to you about, and then I want to give away a mug uh, for all the people that have tuned in. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is what I dare say is probably – in my personal opinion, one of the best uh, tiki bars in operation today would be Undertow in Phoenix. They just opened a new location in Gilbert, I believe it is. I haven't been yeah. there yet because it just opened, uh, but I'm excited to go. I'm excited to see it. Many artists worked on it. Uh, Danny Gallardo did a lot of the yeah. carvings for the bar. You worked on it. Yeah. How did it come about, man? Um, Jason um, and Rich um are good friends of mine they are wonderful friends and uh they approached me uh, a few years ago and said hey we need a big ass um uh dodo bird and they would give me the treatment for the story and and so in this case you know like I said, I can sculpt in anything. So I just, I just said, okay, I'll freehand it in foam and bondo and and all the different techniques I've learned over the years to create props and sets and things like that, and and observed and uh, I just did it for them. And they actually, the both of them showed up at my house and picked it up, um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh and that's i mean there's really no more story than that um so so it's I, like I, this is paper I, mache I, and then um it's felt foam, a foam underneath that i carved and then i did uh some paper mache over that and then i what you see i'm working on there is a um combination of bondo and uh a b what they call a b epoxy which means you got a certain amount of time to work with it. And, but when you mix the two together, it's like clay, but then it hardens up in like, you know, um, 40, 30 minutes or something like that. And then I made those glass eyes um, out of resin and um, a image that I put on the back of the resin to look realistic. And then I, and then uh, um, when you, when you see the one in the end, um, actually at the place, uh, yeah. So all of that, all those quote unquote feathers, you know, I wanted to exaggerate. I didn't want. I, um, so I used a um, uh, a foam, a thin uh, foam, and I uh, I can't remember what it's technically called. But I was like, how do I make a bunch of feathers that are going to last for deck for many, many years? But it uh, looks like a kind of a rustic thing, rustic dodo bird. And so I made a plaster mold of um, a feather shape. And then I heated these pieces of, of flexible foam that were only like, you know, an eighth of an inch thin. And I, with a, with a heat gun. And I pressed them in and then trimmed them. And then I hand 
applied and layered all of those uh, feathers on there. Because um, I knew that, I mean, from experience in the theme park industry, and then there's a, actually a few, like you see on the bottom, actual feathers. Um, just so it looked like, a, you know, there was a little bit of imperfection to the whole thing that made it look like a real bird, you know, that could have been. And a dodo bird, you automatically think it's kind of a dodo, right? You, he's not, he's, he, he doesn't slick his hair and his, and his, and his things back perfectly he's got he's got hair out of place and 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 this and that or feathers out of place so um that's how i approached it and then i airbrushed the whole thing and painted it and uh Where do you I, learn I, mean, to I do just, stuff like that um from years of as i said i've been making things since i was um 10 years old um and so it's years and years and years of uh, of, of that and uh, learning from materials and then watching, you know, as an art, as a creative director at Disney, I would watch all the uh, manufacturing uh, production processes and learn from them. Uh, sometimes I'd jump in and do them myself with them. Um, I'd paint murals or i i jumped in and carved foam i'd do whatever i did and so it taught me a lot you know over the years about how how to make things how to make props how to make things um and this is what you call a one-off which means um there's no mold it was just i just hacked it out uh you know i just made it i made it um freehand and um just like you would a carving or anything else. So, and in a uh, way that it's going to stand the test of time. Yeah. Which you, you kind of have yeah. to do when it's going to be surrounded by drunk people. Exactly. You know, we used to say, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's not quite to this extreme, but at Disney, we used to have the reach sort of thing. Um, like if you think people are on a ride or they're walking through a queue line and they can touch it, it's got to be made or designed a certain way as opposed to the out of reach line. You can get away with more things um, because people will do, unfortunately, vandalist things or they'll stick gum on things. And you don't even want to know all the stories that I ever <laughs> knew about it disney about what people would do uh oh, on space mount on space mountain for example you know when the cleanup crew came on and turned on the lights at the end of the day all the stuff they'd find uh on the concrete floor of that roller coaster uh um, oh. you know or in peter you know the peter pan ride you know people would throw gum and they'd spit and they'd do all this kind of stuff, you know. So, so I think that meant that. Meant what a quality. horrific way to end the show! <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry to. I'm sorry to. The lasting uh, visual uh, of people hucking loogies on Peter reality, Pan's flight. But, yeah. <laughs> but we'll have so to save all, those stories. Ken Ruzik said, yeah. "Awesome show. Do a part two. So we'll have to save all your. We'll do a part two. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really Dude, been I've a had pleasure. a blast. With that said, I think it's time to do a giveaway. Um, our mug giveaways this year, 1390 Tiki Frights, are sponsored by two people, Plantation Rum, which is uh, the brand behind all of our cocktails that we featured this year over the course of the 13 days, and our friends at Tiki Farm, Holden, who we talked about earlier. They are the world's largest manufacturer of tiki mugs. So thank you both to Plantation Rum and to... The family of Tiki Farm. There it is. OFTD. There it is. And I'm sorry, but this is really good rum. And Where did I, it go, I, I, Thor? A <laughs> mug of Huni, I think, got a hold of it. But, Have you been uh, drinking or painting with it? I'm, I'm not going to paint with this. I'm going to drink it. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And with that said, guys, I think it's time to do the giveaway. 
So we have picked a winner. Thor, can you do a drum roll, perhaps, for the winner of the second edition? Your musical part of your brain. Oh. The winner is. By the way, this is the correct way to do a pooter tutor. Well, Kenny, Kenny didn't get it right. There you go. <laughs> For those who don't know what you're talking about, yeah. we'll go back and watch the Ken Rizik interview. Watch Ken Rizik. We had a blast. Congratulations to Robin Yednock. Uh, you have won the second edition Nosferatu mug from our friend Mike Biggs, Big Studio on Instagram. Congratulations. With that said, Thor, um, the last question of the night. What's next? Where should where should people go to follow um, you uh, and, and it, uh, what's going on? Yeah, um, I'm continuing my. Um, we we have so many cool things coming out um, with um, Tiki Land Trading Company. I am so proud to be part of this team. I know out of the gate, it was a tough tough one. As you know that uh, tiki making tiki mugs is not as easy as it looks. And um, people aren't sometimes as um, kind as they could be about uh, because they don't understand that. But I, I love the team. We have a creative team, a highly creative team with, um, uh, gr with really terrific uh, um, skills that overlap each other. None of us exactly the same. And so I'm going to continue to make some really cool stuff. Um, and we're going to pump that out over the next year or two. I mean, maybe more. Um, so that's where I am right now. I'll continue to consult in the entertainment industry. But uh, right now, that's where I'm we're having the most fun. And I do have up here, guys. So TikiLandTrading.com. Uh, they do have mugs on here. Um, probably one of the biggest ones recently is this Contiki commemorative mug, um, which has a reservation system online. So check that out. And then a personal favorite. Um, I love Doug Horn. So, uh, Doug Horn's oh, Doug's great. is probably, yeah. um, one to keep an eye out for. So with that said, dude, I've had a blast. Thank you so much. Um, dude. we'll have to get you on here again sometime soon. Um, okay. Thank you. And, Thanks, uh, Gabe. That's it. Thanks for watching, Gabe. everybody. 13 Love you, nights brother. at Geeky Thrice. Thank you.